Father God, I, I thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to give your word. Uh, Lord, I am I'm not worthy to, uh, to deliver the, the words from this page, Father, but use me as just a conduit for your love, for your compassion, and for your mercy, Lord. Father, we need you this week. We need you today. We need you every moment of our life. Father, make that abundantly clear as we rest in you. Use these words as, as honey to our mouth, Father, to fill us up and give us life. Amen. Um, I want to talk today. Uh, we've been going through this, this uh, series here at LifeHouse on, on our church, our, our, our identity as a church. And it's been really uh, a, a positive thing for me to, uh, for us all, I think, to get feedback on, on how we, and it's, we kind of go through how we're organized and all these other things and, and stuff like that. But it's also our identity as a people of Christ, right? As a body of Christ, people who are active in, in the world and active in the community. And what, uh, what we've done is we've kind of built this big overview picture, right? We've talked about the identity as a whole. And I want to break down today what the identity is as the individual. And I don't want to tell you what your identity is, but I want to give you some tools to search out what your identity is in Christ. Because that's really what's important. What your identity is in Jesus Christ and what your contribution is to the kingdom. Because we can talk about the group picture, but there's an individual dynamic in that that we tend to miss sometimes. And we're not just coming to be passive and, 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 and watch service go by, but we're to be a part of the kingdom of God active in the earth. That's really our call. You know, if someone were to ask me, what's the, what's the, what's the purpose of LifeHouse? Or what's the identity of LifeHouse? Now, I could give them like a, a philosophical listed answer, but if I were just an experiential person, I'd just become a part of the body, one of the things I would say primarily that our identity is, is outreach. I think we really focus on reaching the community and letting people know that they're loved by Jesus. Because that's really what's important. And through my experience here and the support we get from, uh, from Pastor Brett, when we came to be, uh, asked him if he would be consider being the sponsoring church of, of Royal Family, and that's work, by the way. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, uh, they were immediately, yes, immediately on board. And this is a big outreach opportunity. So uh, this is a time where now we get to go out and, and show what, what we are as, as a church, but as a, as a united church. And I also want to give this message because there are times where, um, you know, as directing camp, I get emails from people uh, that have helped at camp in previous years. And I've, I've known people to change their majors in school because of their experience at camp. Maybe the whole trajectory of their life changes. They're like, wow, look at this mission field that I could get involved in. Look at the need out here. And, and what I want to do is, is I feel like sometimes they, they get this kind of unction, but, but they're kind of directionless when it comes to really honing in on their identity. So I want to give you some tools finding your identity uh, in Christ today. And what we do is um, we take and we, 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 we build our wall around our identity, right? And, and our theme this year is Nehemiah at camp. And what I want to talk about is when you, when you put your identity inside a wall, you're protecting it. And you can ask, you know, if you asked me what was my identity, I would say, well, well it's, it's a father, um, it's a husband, I'm, I'm a ministry leader, I'm an evangelist. And the question becomes, how do you protect that? How do you protect your identity? Because you only put inside of a wall what's important. You're only putting in what you're protecting if it's important. And, and, and if you ask me, okay, your, your identity is a father in Christ, right? It's a father and a husband. Well, what are you doing, and that's the wall, what you're doing, what are you doing to ensure that identity remains? Are you praying with your kids? Are you praying for your kids? Are you doing family worship time during the week? Because those are things that secure your identity. And what happens is, what ends up in the walls of our identity is entertainment, work, books, knowledge, all these things that are fleeting. And I ask you that because your identity is, is key. And if we were to follow you for a day, what would we come away with as your identity? Who are you in Christ? What are your priorities? And, and I think about this, uh, you know, as we talk about this peace, and you're this peace to this grand picture, um, I'm reminded of a story. In 1980, uh, SAC Air Force Base um, had all these signals on their radar. And this is the height of the Cold War. So they, they, they scrambled their jets, they flew them out, and they were going to confront the Soviet Union because they were seeing all these signals coming in that they were being attacked, the United States was being attacked. They get out there, nothing was there. 
So the jets turn around, they come back. Well, a couple days later, it happens again. Scramble the jets, they go out, nothing was there, they came back. And they, they said, well, something's wrong then. Something clearly is wrong with our computer system. So they brought an IT guy in, probably Tim Buckles. And uh, <laughs> were you there, Tim? <laughs> and uh, they start picking apart at the, at the computer system, and they found this one chip. And, and the guy said, this is it. This is what's been doing it. And they're like, well, man, that must be, we got to replace this. How much does it cost? It's got to be really important. It's got to be expensive. It was 49 cents. Adjusted for inflation, 50 cents. A 50 cent, 49 cent chip made a huge impact. Almost launched World War III. Your, Your identity in the whole and in Christ's body is that important. Your identity can literally change the world. The question is, are you obedient to the controller? Are you saying, yes, Lord, whatever you call me to, I'm gonna do that? And I'm going to build my wall around that identity and I'm going to do everything I can to preserve it so the enemy cannot get in and destroy what you're doing. Because if we don't put the right things around our identity, it's, the enemy will take it from you. You have no chance if you're not putting walls around who you are in Christ Jesus. No chance. I'm reminded by a man by the name of Henry Cherokee. Um, it looks like Garricky, but it's Cherokee. He's not Native American. And he's... Uh, he was a man who knew his identity. Because if he didn't know his identity, he easily would have quit what he was called to do. Henry, Henry Cherokee was a man, he, was, he, he went to a seminary late in life, so he's an older gentleman, he became a Lutheran pastor. Signed up for the, the military, he was, uh, this was winding down of World War II, and he became a chaplain. So they called him over to Europe, and he was, he was taking care of all these people in the POW war camp. So he'd see all these people who had been tortured and, and, and been through all kinds of horrible treatment, emaciated by the Nazis, okay? And, and, and this was his experience for months on end. He just worked with people like that. And then he got a call from his boss one day. His boss said, hey, we're going to transfer you, chaplain. We're going we're gonna to move you somewhere else. He says, okay, fine. Where are you going to move me? He says, we're going to move you to Nuremberg. If you know what Nuremberg was, it's where they tried the Nazi leaders. He was called at that moment, not by his boss, but by Christ, to go and minister to the people who had been committing all the atrocities he had, he had been helping the people endure on the other side. He knew his identity in Christ, and that allowed him to do something that nobody, that a lot of us would probably shirk away from. In fact, the only reason they had a chaplain at Nuremberg, did you know this, was, was in order that the, the leaders of the Nazi movement didn't kill themselves. They did not want them to escape judgment. They said, we don't care what you do. Just don't let them kill themselves. And he took his role very seriously. And he went there and he spent time with these men who did horrible things. And he invested in them. This was a man who knew his identity. And as I want to, I want to talk about your identity. I want to talk about Nehemiah, how he found, or these are the tools that I believe Nehemiah gives us on how to find, find our identity in Christ. We'll start here at, at uh, three qualities that Nehemiah had that I think helped him find identity or their admonitions to us to find identity. First off, he kept God's vision in his heart. This is something that we, we greatly err on a lot. I, me, primarily. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Number two, he never looked back. We have no indication in all of Nehemiah that he ever shirked from what God called him to. How often do we feel like, oh, Lord, you kind of called me to this, but I don't really want to go. I've got other things to do. Nehemiah didn't look back. He put his plow in and he went. I remember when I went back to school late in life, I was uh, 27, I went back to school to get my teaching certificate and um, like a year in, a guy had come up to me and he said, hey, would you take over my business? It was like a financial business. I was in banking before that. And I told him, I said, I said, I've put my plow in and I'm not looking back. And that's the attitude that God wants from us. When you put the plow in the ground, you go and you don't quit and you never look back. And number three, he knew when he was done. This is different than quitting. And I want to spend some time on that because I think that is the biggest issue we have in the church and in ministry today knowing when you're done. Okay, go to the next one. All right. So Nehemiah, let's get this story set up. He kept God's vision in his heart. Nehemiah wasn't a guy that went and broadcast everything. Nehemiah was a guy that waited on God until it was time, until the iron was hot and he struck. 
We can see that in Nehemiah chapter 1. If you have your Bible, I don't have it up here. So um, in the first chapter, um, it indicates the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev. Now, this is important. Some things we gloss over, but this is important. It's the month of Kislev when he first hears of the walls of Jerusalem and how dilapidated they are at this point. Now, if we go to chapter 2, first verse, in the month of Nisan. Now, if you calculate these months out, that's four months. And what happens is, Nehemiah, he, he then goes before Artaxerxes, and he's, he's downcast, and he's broken. And Artaxerxes says, what's wrong, Nehemiah? He says, well, well the walls of my, my homeland are in ruins. But you've got to realize, Nehemiah waited four months before he said anything. Before he didn't even say anything, before he indicated anything. And we have this propensity to broadcast everything God tells us or every unction we feel of God to just throw it out there to the wind. And what happens is when we throw it out there like that, it blows away with the wind most of the time. And I say that from experience. I've known of things that God I know had for me for blessings and I'll go and broadcast them and then they're gone. And I feel like he's always been telling me, Luke, I'm stirring something in your heart. Let me finish my work. And when you feel like God is telling you something or leading you somewhere, let him, let him stir that in you. Let him bring it. Because in due time, you will reap a harvest if you faint not. But it's when we go out and we're always talking and we're not, we nonstop communicating. And we hide nothing. We have no privacy anymore. <laughs> we put everything voluntarily on the internet, but then when some company leaks our information, we have a fit. <laughs> I've never understood that. This is a spiritual thing, and you have to keep things in your heart. I believe God speaks to the inner man. And we see that right here. He says, I went to Jerusalem, Nehemiah, so he got his commission from Artaxerxes. After he let it ferment for four months, Artaxerxes, go, build your wall. He got the blessing. And after staying there three days, he went and he didn't even say anything for three days. I'd ride in town like the hero. I'd have a big party. But Nehemiah waited. He knew better. And what did he do? He says, I set out during the night with a few others. Now, this is interesting. You've got to realize what he's doing here. He's looking at the wall. Have you ever had an insurance adjuster come and look at your roof at night? <laughs> I'd claim everything. <laughs> Nobody assesses damage at night. You see, but what we're learning here is something different from Nehemiah. He wasn't as worried about assessing the damage. He knew what was going on. He was wanting God to speak to him at night. There are night prayers, Gethsemane prayers, that we must endure in order to hear clearly from God. Sometimes we're kept up. Sometimes we can't sleep. Or, or we're so, you know, we, we, have, we, we plan our day so tight we have no time with God. And then in the middle of the night, maybe we can't sleep or something's stirring us. And we resist and, and I ask, maybe that's God trying to talk to you. Maybe there's a night time, there's a night watch that he needs you to be in prayer about. I can remember a few times I felt God's burden so heavy on me that I had to get up out of bed and just pray before the Lord. And I had no idea what I was praying about, no clue what God was stirring in my heart. But I know he was saying, I need your time right now. And we can look through scripture and in, in, in Psalm 17, we see David, he says, Lord, the Lord examines my heart at night. There are things that happen at night that cannot happen during the day. It is my contention. Go to uh, that Matthew scripture. I think it's next on here. We'll bounce back to that, guys. Um, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called, place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive press. Jesus was going to be pressed down. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Then he went, going a little further, he went and fell with his face to the ground and prayed. We've got to have our eyes open to what's going on in the earth. Because there is severe heartbreak. There is serious torment. People are bound and they need delivered. And you're the pieces God is using to restore his people. 
to restore humanity, to deliver the bound, to bind the brokenhearted. But we're so unwilling to go through a Gethsemane prayer because it takes brokenness to bring revival. There's a, there's a saying by Leonard Ravenhill, I love it, I've always attached to it, God doesn't hear your prayers. He hears your desperate prayers. When was the last time you were broken? When was the last time you wept over something? We went to a counselor this week, oh, a couple weeks ago. Um, he goes, he looks at me and he's kind of like, when was the last time you cried? Kind of said, asked me that. I said, oh, I cry all the time. <laughs> I'm a blubbering fool. I really am. Because I feel, I've always prayed that God would give me compassion. Please pray that. Because the, and Isaiah says, with deep compassion, I will restore my people. Not with wonderful theology, not with great speakers, not with, not with all these fancy trinkets, but with deep compassion, I will restore my people. Nothing less. And he will accept nothing less. If you think you're going to do it through books and how-to manuals, you're missing it. It's through compassion and love that never stops. Faith, hope, love, the greatest of these is love. Jesus went through the Gethsemane prayer, obviously. And we're called to do the same. What's your Gethsemane prayer? So there's two things in this. Go back to that uh, number scripture. Nehemiah, I'm sorry, right here. Um, first, he set out during the night. Let God talk to you at night. Don't resist it. I've said this before, I'll say it again. You know what the Netflix said, their CEO said their greatest competitor is? Not Blockbuster, well, obviously not Blockbuster. <laughs> that was a terrible announcement. Well, I'm like, Video Kingdom, man. man I'm, whoo, showing my age. The VHS movement's coming back, baby. Um, Netflix said their biggest competitor was sleep. If you don't think you're in a war, you're in a war. Enemy wants to bind you every which way. So the first thing is, don't resist God. I think there's things that he says at night. In, in Daniel, every time Daniel received the vision, it was at night. We go, why doesn't God talk to me? Because you're so busy, there's so much noise. Get away from things for a while. I, I had so many stories I could tell with that. But anyway, and the other thing is, he told no one, I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. He didn't tell anybody. I mean, his guys going with him must have thought he was crazy. And he only took a few. He's like, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. That's a hard thing to do. You ever have God kind of stir something up and you're like, I got this great thing that God is doing. But I, I just can't say anything. I got to keep it in. Because he's working on the inner man. And there's things he has to do with you before you can do anything in the world. He has got to grow within you before you can change the world. He says, okay, I didn't, I didn't tell anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. Okay, what's the next one there? Um, go to that, uh, here we go. One of my favorite scriptures, uh, uh, the, my, the King James translation is, is my second favorite, concordant literal I really enjoy too, but it says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now he's saying, there's gonna be glory revealed in you saints, okay? Get ready for that. The sufferings that you're going through, the Gethsemane prayers are nothing of the glory which you are, which is gonna be revealed in you, not to you, in you, okay? Read, the, the, the words mean good things. Okay, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature awaiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. A concordant literal says unveiling. And I like that word better. Because unveiling, it's like I, had a, I have a blanket over this. It's been here the whole time. You've been in the earth. God's remnant has been in the earth the whole time. If you ever think God has missed an age, he hasn't. Even though his church has gotten small at times, it's not gone. It's a remnant. And he's saying the earnest expectation of the creature, that means the world is waiting in eager expectation for the manifestation of the sons of God. They are waiting for the sheet to be pulled back. And I ask you, will you be ready when the sheet is pulled back? Are you finding out who you are in Christ? Are you digging deeper in the word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you waiting on God? What are your priorities? Because the sheet will be removed. The expectation is that the people are hungry for it. So much bondage. If 
but there's so much power. Okay, go to the next one there. Okay, um, this is the next one. So this, uh, this is the second point. So we had, first off, we know that Nehemiah kept God's vision in his heart. Okay, so the first thing you do is you keep it in your heart. I think the Lord just tells me pretty bluntly, just shut up. <laughs> That's how he talks to me anyway. He says, be quiet, Luke. You don't have to tell everybody everything. You want to. And you're thinking that now. Hallelujah. <laughs> be quiet, brother. Um, but here is something interesting. He never looked back. And, and you're thinking, yeah, well, he, he, had, he had everybody on his side. He had all this, this, this help and stuff like that. Um, if we go to, this is Nehemiah chapter 4, if you're wondering, verse, verse 10. It says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Now, if you remember, Nehemiah had a lot of uh, persecution from outside. There were people, enemies of Israel, that were trying to discourage him from building the wall. But this is Judah, guys. It's one thing to have negativity come from outside. We can handle that a lot of times. We'll run to the church. We'll run to counselors in Christ. We'll run to good things. But what happens when it comes from inside the body? You ever had that happen? All of a sudden, inside the body, there's this negativity. And you're thinking, God, you've called me to do this. Yet Judah, now remember, we look at Judah in all of Deuteronomy, and God constantly says, Judah, you're first. Judah is praised. Judah goes first. Their camp was on the east side. Everything about Judah indicated the authority of God. And that's where the line of Jesus comes in. But here's Judah saying, it can't be done. There's no way, Nehemiah, we can't even clear the rubble to get to the foundation to begin building the wall again. Negativity from inside the body will destroy. It will corrupt. It is a cancer. And I love how Nehemiah handles it. He um, says, uh, there is so much rubble, we can't rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to their work. Here's inside the body. They're like, yeah, we, uh, we can do this. And they start and like, we can't do this. And then all of a sudden they're, they're counting in what the enemies are saying. Now the enemy's word is God's word apparently to them. You know what? God's work should be impossible. It should be. Because then we know it's not about us. I love what Hudson Taylor said. He said, there are three stages in every great work of God. First, it's impossible. Then it's difficult. Then it's done. And we see things as they are, which is what keeping the vision in your heart, the Gethsemane prayer, we begin to see things as they are, but that overwhelms us sometimes. You've got to remember who you serve. And when God calls you to something, you never look back. You continue forward. Nehemiah, if you go on to read that, um, uh, then the Jews said, uh, who lived near, the came, near and came, uh, told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Again, that negativity. But if you read on in Nehemiah, he says, um, he goes, Nehemiah didn't even doubt. He didn't even question it. He was like, oh, okay, well, if there's a problem, put a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. What's the matter? I love his attitude. He's so like flippant about it. Go to that Josephus uh, text real quick. Is that the next one? This is what Josephus says. So insensible of any trouble, this was Nehemiah, out of his desire to perfect his work. And ne Nehemiah was like, so he didn't even see it. He's like, I don't care. Don't you understand God's called me to this? D you don't get it, Judah. You think we're going to quit because of a little rubble? You think we're going to quit because some enemies want to attack you? Hello? You are servants of the Most High God. Of course the enemy's going to attack you. Have some faith. God will use you. He will make a way in the desert. So many times we get overwhelmed with the situations that are going on. Look at, look at, look at human sex trafficking, for one. <laughs> That's a war. That is a battle. Look, I don't, I'll, I don't have the answer to that. But I know it's a plague on our, on our, on our world. And it's an absolute work of the enemy. 
But does that mean God can't use you to totally turn that situation around? Does that mean, is it too big for you? Yeah, it's too big for you. It's not too big for God. But we need to think like Nehemiah. You can't do that. Brett, you can't do that, brother. That's not going to work. <laughs> he goes, yeah. <laughs> What's the deal? Just keep going. So what? If God brings an end to it, so what? Then it's God's job, right? It's not our job to call when it quits. That's his job. Nehemiah never looked back. I think there's a numbers scripture next. What is that one? Okay, this is one of my favorite things to preach out of. This is numbers, uh, what we got? Numbers 13. This is a great study. If you ever want to get into, uh, into just, it's the story of them going into the land of promise, right? And they're scouting it out. And who are the two guys that came back with positive words? Shout them out. Caleb and Joshua. You, can you name two of the guy, other 10? You can't name anybody else that went in to the land, can you? You see, Caleb went in, and Joshua, and he, they sent one leader from every tribe. So 12 total. Two came back with a positive word. 10 came back going, oh, we can't do this. Those 10 men are well known for being unknown. Who are you going to be? Because Caleb, Caleb had an edge. I like Caleb, man. I, I, I just, I love preaching on Caleb. It, his name means dog. Did you know that? Dogged. Like, like, like tough. Like he didn't fool around. You read Caleb's life story, man. He was one of the two that got to go back. And you watch him. He was taking out, uh, he was taking out giants that was like 80. I mean, this guy would not quit. And here's Caleb. He, Caleb silenced the people before Moses said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Not a doubt in his mind. Not a doubt in Caleb's mind that God can do this work. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. Of course, in the flesh, you are not strong. But when I am weak, he is strong. His power is perfected in my weakness. I glory in being weak. I glory in not being the smartest guy in the room. Because then I know it's just God. It's all about him. He says, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. Again, this disease goes out. This negativity goes out. And you, before you know it, uh, um, they said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our eyes and we looked, uh, we looked the same to them. Do you know what they wanted to do to Caleb and Joshua? Does anybody remember? They were going to stone them. They were going to stone them for a good report. <laughs> what, what is wrong? I would like to say we've come a long way, but I don't know if we have. Have you read the news lately? We love to feed negativity. Feed it like a pet, and it becomes a disease, and it ruins our testimony. Because we begin to doubt whether God can actually move through his people or not. We begin to listen to the noise. And the enemy is so interested in distracting you with discouragements and distractions and all these other things. He wants you to stop for a second and start looking around and taking stock of who you are. Because in the flesh, you are nothing. But Christ has come in to set you free that you might be free indeed. Caleb, I just, I'm so inspired by Caleb and his heart. And he wasn't even an Israelite. You can follow his lineage back. He, was a, he came in from the outside. And he was one that said, no, we're doing this. We can do this. I'm telling you, church, don't be discouraged by the news today. Don't be discouraged by what you think is negativity because God is doing great things in the hearts of his people. It's under the veil. Take a minute and ask God, what can you do with me to bring down the strongholds of the enemy and, and be willing to be obedient to God in whatever he calls you to. Because it might not be attractive. It might not be your name in lights. I can give you so many stories of guys you've never heard of because they served God in obscurity. There's a story Alan Redpath tells how he went to preach at this church 
and, and he heard that a woman wanted to see him. And this woman had been paralyzed for like 12 years. This was back in the early 1900s or mid-1900s. So he, he says, okay, I'll go see her. And he's thinking the whole time, what am I going to say? He says, I, how do you talk to someone like this that's, that's enduring this? And, 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 and it, it, what, what am I going to say of comfort? I haven't endured anything like this. And he walks in and, and he's sitting there and, and she can tell he's struggling for things to say. And she says immediately, don't have pity on me. He said, she said this, she told him, I told God a few weeks before this happened, you do anything with me you want. I will be totally obedient to you. A few weeks later, she became paralyzed. And she said, she has never known so much joy in resting in God. She would sit there and she would pray constantly before the Lord. And it was at the end, Redpath said, it was where he felt he was going to offer her some consolation and she's feeding him. She knew something or she knew someone. That's power. That's someone who says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to advance this kingdom through the love of Jesus Christ. All right, my last point. Go to the next one, guys. Finally, um, Nehemiah understood when he was done. There's something that happens, and, uh, and they talk about it a lot in ministries and, and, and churches even, but it's called mission drift. It's when you start out doing one thing, and you end up doing something totally different. And it's not at all what your original mission was. And... Nehemiah had an understanding of when the work was done. Now go to that six. Here we go. So, so here's, here's Nehemiah. The wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. That's a fast wall. Now realize that for 100 years, Israel did nothing or made no progress building the wall. 100 years, they were already back in the land, and they did nothing. They didn't care about their identity. They weren't building a wall around it. They were sitting and waiting, and the enemy did what? They came in and attacked them every time. Every time they got somewhere, the enemy would tear it down. It took Nehemiah a whopping 52 days. Now, for most of us in this modern day and age, if we did something like that, our first inclination would be, I'm pretty good at this wall building stuff start me a company. We'd buy some trucks and some concrete and some things and we'd start building walls all over. Jericho needs a wall. Right? <laughs> that was a delay. Like, what? Jericho? Is that your Hastings? I meant Junietta. <laughs> but the point is, we would take it on and we'd say I was me. And I did that and I'm going to keep doing it because I'm good at it. So apparently I can build good walls, so I'm going to keep doing this. And we'd expand it. We'd make a business. And, and, and we in America, we'd start making money off of it. Not Nehemiah. Uh, he says, when all, uh, um, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Quick side note before I continue on on that point. Um, your enemies will shudder when you start doing things in the name of God. I want... I want Satan and his minions, whatever you call them, to shudder when my feet hit the floor in the morning. I want a little power and authority. I don't want to be the guy that was told, we know Paul and we know Jesus, but who are you? Primarily because he was sent out naked. But um, uh, besides that, I want to be known. I want to have a walk with God that says, when he comes around, and this is the enemy saying this, all these demons, better watch it. He knows God. He knows, he knows God. And when you start getting some wins, man, the enemy starts shuddering. Now their enemies weren't messing with them. They were worried about it now. They're concerned about Nehemiah. Before they were attacking him, now they're worried about him. But while this was going on, um, okay, so uh, now, okay, that was 
6, or chapter 6. Now we go to chapter 13, okay? So what happens in that time span, I'm going to sum this up for you real quick, is they, they reinstated, the te- uh, re- reinstated all the temple stuff, and, and uh, they had the wall built, and they were corrupting the temple again. Tobias had brought in all these things, was doing bad stuff in the temple. And, and Nehemiah heard about this. But the question is, where was Nehemiah at this time? He says, but while all this was going on, I wasn't even in Jerusalem. Well, why? He just got done building the wall. Wouldn't you stay and run everything now? He says, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Nehemiah understood something. He knew when the job was done. He knew when his mission was complete and he wasn't about to drift from it. The worship team can come up now if you'd like. Um, He understood that God was calling him to something else. And that was obedience primarily. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about Nehemiah's name and lights. It wasn't about him making a big kingdom for himself. It was about him building a wall. And he did the job. He went back to Jerusalem for 13 years. 13, 14 years, somewhere in there. And then he came back. And uh, um, um, Tobias was corrupting the temple. And he cleaned them all out. He corrected all the uh, corrupt doctrine that was going on, being preached and taught in the temple. And he restored it back unto God. And he became one of the most respected uh, governors in Jerusalem because he was obedient to God. I, I think, I think my, my inclination would be to stay and, and to run everything and to be the guy in charge. But not Nehemiah, he understood God's heart. I, had a, I was really struggling in my ministry. Um, this, was, this was a while ago. And I was struggling because I felt like um, what I had done wouldn't, wouldn't be what I could do forever. And, and that hurt me because I worked really hard uh, to get the ministry going and, and, and things like that. And I was, I was like heartbroken. I, I, was, I, I went before the Lord a lot and I was like, God, why, why am I not satisfied? Why am I not fulfilled? What, what am I doing wrong? And uh, I, uh, a wise brother told me, there are planters and there are tillers. And he said, Luke, you're not a tiller. He says, you're a planter. He says, when, when he, he told me this, he said, if, if you're in the same place in five years, I'll, I'll be surprised. Not, not geographically or logistically, but in the same place as far as the ministry. And I really needed to hear that. That was like honey to my mouth. It was like that apothecary that just, it just felt good to hear. Because to then, I thought I had to do it all. And God wasn't going to raise up these other people. But he is. And I felt like being in that place, knowing my identity is not a tiller, maybe. It's a planter has freed me to do what God's going to use me for. And you all here have been called for something. You've been called to a purpose. You're that 49 cent chip. And you are hunting for your identity and you're asking God, what exactly are you going to use me for? And we're asking, I'm telling you to begin to build your wall around your identity. Search it out find it and then build your wall around it because it needs to be protected you've got to put up walls around the enemy now I'm going to do something that is uh, un I want to say unorthodox I don't know if that's it but I want to build a wall today I know we look at scripture and we're like, oh, it's a real wall, man. That's awesome. You're the wall now. You're the wall sometimes. When it comes to the corporate body, you're the wall. So what I want to do is worship team's going to come out. I want us to, I want, I want the, I don't know exactly how this is going to look. I just do things and I don't know what's going on. I hope we're going to land the plane. <laughs> uh, but what I want to do is everybody stand up and I want us to, to hold hands around this, this, this church, okay, on the outer perimeter. And what we're going to do is I want the royal family people on the inside because I'm telling you, I'm being totally 
candid and honest with you. You are our wall of protection. And the enemy would love nothing more than to ruin this ministry this week. And we need your prayers. I'll I'll be very honest with you. There has been so much going on for me in the last couple months. I haven't had the time that I should or haven't taken the time I should to pray up for what we're about to do. I'm honest with you. I will never lie to you. So I'm asking you to stand in my stead. I'm asking you to build a wall around us this week. Usually we do prayer sheets and we have people take them home and they pray. We have called prayer partners and stuff. I didn't even get that done this year, guys. So I'm asking you, and we're all asking you, to be our wall. And I think if you could do that physically, we'd feel it a lot more spiritually. So as the worship team comes out, wherever they at, I always ask them and they hide in the back. They're like shuddering back there. <laughs> uh, I want, let's, let's do this now and then Brett's going to pray us out. They're going to play one closing song and then I want Pastor Brett to pray us out as we close this. So let's have everybody that's not going to camp, build a, church, build a wall around this church and let's have the, the, the royal family folks inside the wall. And, and we need to pray protection. We need to pray provision. We need to pray God's wisdom upon everybody involved. Because this is our wall. You are our wall. You are our defense from the enemy. You are everything that we need in this moment. We're going into battle, ladies and gentlemen. This is wartime. And we're not fooling around with the enemy. We're getting really serious and we're about to take some things back that have been taken from us. Well, I want to address the people in the blue shirt for a minute, but this really goes along with everybody. And let me just say, as it was said back, as they were looking into the promised land, there is a promised land for what God has in store for this week. But I want to tell everybody, there's giants in the land. There is going to be giants. There's going to be enemies in the land this week, okay? But I'll tell you what, I don't want to be one of the 10. I don't want to be one of the two. Let me be a Caleb and a Joshua and say, you've been called for this. Okay, we look and say, okay, what's, what's our purpose? Luke, you talked about, you know, what's our identity? Okay, your identity is this, that you do the mission of God. Okay, this is a, a co-mission service, okay? Co-mission, okay? So there is a mission for Royal Family Kids Camp today. And by the way, all of you on the outside, there, there, there's a mission for you this week, whether you're at camp or not. There's something that God has for you to do this week. And the co part is you do it together. <laughs> You don't do it alone, you do it together. Okay, but I want you to know, there's giants. Okay, you do it together, and you're going to get the job done. Uh, Luke talked in Romans today, talking about the sufferings, and after the sufferings, the glory shall be revealed. All right, there's going to be sufferings this week. In, in your life, all the people on the outside, there's going to be sufferings. Every, every single day, there's going to be trials that's going to take place. And when you're at camp, don't you dare think that the enemy is not going to try to attack you and try to knock off God's mission, okay? There's going to be enemies. There's going to be giants, all right? There's going to be sufferings this week. When you look into those kids' eyes this week and you identify what hell they have been through, it is going to be a struggle. I just go up and just do the carnival. You guys are going to get to know those kids even better than I even come close to knowing. It's going to be tough. Okay, but you know what? Here, here's the mission is... God's glory wants to be revealed through you. If you follow his mission, you stay encouraged. I don't care how big the enemies are. Those enemies will come down. You will be victorious. By the way, you are victorious. Okay, we're, we're not fighting for victory here, folks. We're fighting from victory. God has already won. Don't you dare back down. Don't you dare be discouraged. God is with you. He isn't going to leave you. He isn't going to forsake you. You stay with him. He will win the the battle. Those kids are coming. They are are preparing right now. We are going to win the battle in the hearts of these kids today for Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what you're being commissioned to right now. That's the mission that God has for you. And 
outside perimeter, okay, that's, that's your mission this week is these people right here, they stay protected and that these kids are set free. They will be transformed this week. Their life will be changed this week. That's what we do around here. We set people free through Jesus Christ. So let's just pray and let's commission this staff. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we are so honored, God, to be used by you. The God of the universe, the almighty God. I don't know why, God, that you choose to partner with feeble people like us, but you do. And, well, here's the reason why. Because when something happens through us, we know it's you doing it. And even though the staff goes today as weak humans, we are weak in ourselves, but God, we are so strong in you. And I pray right now that the anointing of God, Holy Spirit, that you begin to fill this staff and these prayer warriors around here as we built this wall, that you would begin to, to fill them, God, with understanding with spiritual discernment, God, that we would see things before things would take place. We would be able to see in the hearts, God, of these kids. We would be able to see the healing that they need, God. And as we share Jesus Christ with them, the, 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 the bound up ones, God, would be set free in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, that you would begin to melt the hearts of those kids right now, even before they get to camp, God. And the words, God, that come out of these staff's mouth, God, would be like honey to them. Father, we just pray that your son Jesus is glorified in everything we do this week. And God, as the sponsoring church of Royal Family Kids Camp, we commission them right now, co-mission, that we join together in the mission that you have for these kids this week, God, and that your glory, even through the sufferings, God, your glory, God, will be revealed, God, at Royal Family Kids Camp and through the body of Christ coming together, God, doing your mission together, God. They are commissioned in the name of Jesus. They will be victorious. We speak that prophetic word into them right now, God, that they are victorious, that those kids are set free, God, God, that lives will be changed. They are changed in the name of Jesus. Amen.